This Restorative Justice Life is a production of Amplify RJ. Follow us on all social media platforms at Amplify RJ. Sign up for our email list and check out our website at AmplifyRJ.com to stay up to date on everything we have going on. Make sure you're subscribed to this feed on whatever platform you're listening on right now so you don't miss an episode. And finally, we'd love it if you left us a rating and review. It really helps us literally amplify this work. Thanks for listening. Enjoy the episode. Welcome to This Restorative Justice Life, the podcast that explores how the philosophy, practices, and values of restorative justice apply to our everyday lives. I'm your host, David Ryan Barcega Castro Harris, all five names for the ancestors, and I'm the founder of Amplify RJ. On this podcast, I talk with RJ practitioners, circle keepers, and others doing this work about how this way of being has impacted their lives. Before we get going with today's episodes, I want to share a couple words about what's going on in the world right now. So today is Wednesday, January 6th. If you don't know, um, today was the day that a bunch of pro-Trump supporters uh, stormed the Capitol building in an act of domestic terrorism. Um, Helen Thomas is here with us. She was the guest on the fourth episode of this podcast. Uh, We're here to talk a little bit about the decolonizing uh, your classroom, decolonizing and indigenizing your classroom workshop series. She's going to be running later this month Today you posted that settler colonialism is not an event, but a structure. Um, In light of what's happening today, which is an event that um, is showing um, the strength and the entrenched power of settler colonialism, um, why is it important that uh, we decolonize and indigenize our classrooms? Yeah, I think it's really important today because I think a lot of times when we see overtly racist um, or white supremacist things going on in our country. I I feel like, I don't know if you see this always, but like somebody posting, well, like somebody learned that or like, and that those people are at one point in a classroom. And I think that's why it's so important for all educators to decolonize and indigenize their classroom. I think uh, some people might assume that a decolonizing and indigenizing a workshop series is aimed at educators who are working with Indigenous students, but really decolonization is for all of us. And um, events like what happened today just show, yeah, like you said, how entrenched um, settler supremacy, which is so inherently tied with white supremacy, um, how they show up in our country. Uh, I know for myself, today really made me um, was upsetting considering how my relatives and our relatives all over the country have been treated so differently than these Trump supporters in a situation like this. So um, I think it's important for everybody to consider decolonizing, um, but educators specifically, because we have a responsibility to future generations um, to think about what we're upholding and perpetuating in our classrooms and what we're resisting and challenging. Yeah, so you're going to be starting this workshop series. Uh, It's going to be monthly starting January 23rd and then February, March, April, May. Um, What are you going to be talking about? What are you going to be covering? What are people going to experience? Yeah, so um, in terms of content, uh, we're going to be talking, it is going to be definitely geared towards educators, although that can mean informal, formal educators. Um, I think learning happens everywhere, and I think this is really relevant for anyone working with youth in general. But we're going to talk about uh, settler colonialism in schools. That's the first topic for January. And then we're going to, it's important to name that, I think, and discuss it. But I want to really move forward beyond just a deficit narrative of how traumatized Indigenous people have been in the country and moving more towards how can we learn from and with Indigenous people. So the workshop series, the other topics, um, Indigenous erasure and anti-colonial mindsets and practices, indigenous knowledge, and then affirming indigenous sovereignty are all um, geared towards supporting educators and actually taking action towards decolonizing and indigenizing their classroom. And then in terms of what educators are gonna experience, um, all the workshops are formatted in a way that's really rooted in restorative justice and um, indigenous values. And I would also say a trauma-informed approach Um, in terms of creating a sense of community and support for people who want to start this decolonizing journey. I think it's really important. And one of the things that I've loved about 
being involved in Amplify RJ workshops is that sense of community and trust that's cultivated, that proactive part of restorative justice. So during these workshops, people, we're hoping that people will feel that sense of trust and support and be able to engage in really meaningful conversations in small groups. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I know there are already a bunch of people signed up and the way that we're going to preserve that small group environment is to uh, largely use breakout groups, but also, um, as, so you're getting to meet people all across the country, but uh, you're also going to be providing opportunities for people to connect with each other um, during during the times between the workshops. Um, it's super important that community drives this learning. Um, thank you so much, Helen, for sharing. Um, if people are looking to sign up, we'll definitely have the link to all of that in the show notes. Please follow Decolonize Your Classroom on Instagram. And um, yeah, anything else you want to say? Uh, just Pilama Yaye, thank you for having me and for um, helping me cultivate this space for educators to engage in this unlearning. Welcome to our first episode of 2021. What a time to be alive. I hope your new year has been happy so far, although there's quite a lot going on in the world. I hope today's episode will give you some hope and knowledge on how to navigate this new year. Today's guest is one of the most widely published authors in the field of restorative justice and peacemaking. When I first learned about restorative justice and peace circles, the name Kay Pranis came up over and over, and since then I've had the privilege of getting to learn from her writing and speeches, but also sitting with her in circle, listening and observing on a number of occasions. One of the things I most appreciate about her is even with her 30 plus years of experience doing this work all over the US, Canada, Brazil, and more, she's still constantly learning and doesn't hesitate to share. Strap in, because this is a long one, but it's full of great stories and learning. Enjoy our conversation. Welcome, Kay. Thank you. Who are you? Um, I am this accident in the work that I have done. Uh, and I say that because it's not anything I ever planned. Uh, and, and one of the ways I describe that is that I have no formal training in any related field. I never dreamed of, I never had a vision for where I am and, and the work that I've been doing. So it wasn't anything that came from my initiative. Uh, so the work I've been doing is sharing this process called circle with or peacemaking circles um, with people. And I have come to understand that work as uh, sort of laying the ground for cultural transformation. Uh, and the work is bigger than my own understanding. Um, I see myself as an agent of forces that, that I can't see and don't understand. Uh, and I mostly just try to, to show up um, so that whatever, whatever those forces are that, that they don't cause harm. <laughs> um, second, and that, who are, oh, go yeah. ahead. I was gonna say second, who are you? But because <laughs> I didn't want you to like spend them all on just like this first, first piece, uh, who are you? <laughs> Uh, so uh, I trained the way the form that has taken is that, that I train in, uh, this process called peacemaking circles and do some writing about that, that emerged in the context of restorative justice. Although, um, I see it in some ways as broader than the focus of, of restorative justice. And, um, I am, uh, also very much, a um, a person uh, who has found respite in nature all my life. Uh, and I'm a grandmother of six and a, a mother of three. And um, and I, I am trying to figure out how to, uh, how to understand my own life and the life around me. So, yeah. Who am I? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, I generally answer, ask the question seven times, and you've given me so much in two answers. So let's just give it two more. Who are you? I, there's some other answer I have to that. Because uh, I ask this question in circles all the time. <laughs> mm -hmm. And there are many ways to, 
to take it and there's some other answer that has occurred to me and I can't remember right now what that is. Um, so I did mention that, that that I didn't initiate this particular journey. Oh, I'm just aware that there's a bruise on my cheek that people might be wondering about. So I'm a, I actually can't see it. Yeah, okay. I'm a cross country skier. Right? <laughs> just came back from a week at the the cabin and and I don't even remember what happened, but it turned out to be a, a bruise. Um, I am a, a responder. So for instance, I said I didn't initiate this journey. Also, I, I've done a lot of writing. I never initiate any of the pieces that I've written that have been published, I never initiated. Every one of them was initiated by someone else asking me to, to join them in something or just asking me to write something like for a newsletter or a, a, a chapter in a book or something like that. And so one of the things I've come to understand about who I am is that I'm not very good at initiating. I'm highly responsive to what people um, ask uh, of me, where that fits with, <laughs> with what I want to be doing. Um, and so that's, it's kind of important to know about myself is I'm not very good at starting something. Uh, I'm very good at responding to what somebody else starts. Mm, yeah. Um, you kind of got the cross country skier in there and then the responder. So I'm going to let us end with that uh, for the who are you pieces. We're going to talk a lot about the intersections of all of those things um, in, in a moment. But before we do, it's always good to check in. So in the fullest uh, way of asking this question, how are you? I'm in a place of some confusion about what I am to do at this point in my life. Um, and that has not been a question I've had to worry about for a long time. <laughs> I have just been responding to what came up in front of me and responding to as many of the requests as I possibly could. Um, and, most, and that involved a lot of movement and a lot of, of travel. And it was just, my purpose was very clear. I never had any, not never, but in this work, I've really not at all struggled with um, what it is I'm supposed to be doing. But COVID interrupted that and it interrupted it at a good time. I needed to stop what I was doing because I can't sustain it physically. Um, and now I'm not sure, you know, what my role is. So how am I? <laughs> um, I'm in this sort of state of uncertainty, which is not comfortable for me about, even though I talk all the time about the importance of being able to sit in a space of not knowing the answers, but hard to do myself in this moment. So, so a little bit of unease in my life right now about um, do I stop? Do I just sort of retire? I had never even considered retiring, but the, but I can't continue to do what I was doing and I don't, I don't know what the in-between is. Um, so there's some unease there. On the other hand, uh, what I'm feeling at this point in my life is also just gratitude beyond words. Just unbelievable gratitude for the, the gift uh, my life has given me of the, the people, the people that I have met and spent time with. Uh, especially in the last six years. Uh, so it feels all mixed up. Right? And, it, and it, it really, I mean, that, the times we're in feel all mixed up to me. The, uh, the, the grief and the sadness is so deep. And at the same time, the gratitude and the joy. And I'm seeing things happen that I didn't think were going to happen in my lifetime in terms of the kinds of conversations that, that this moment has brought um, around race and privilege and recognition of historical trauma. Um, so I don't know how I am <laughs> uh, trying to figure it out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and that's all any of us can be doing. Um, we're recording this on 
January 6th. I don't always post the podcast right after I record them, but I've been sharing with folks um, a lot of the same feeling lost and confused for some similar reasons, some different, right? Uh, Amplify RJ is in a place where uh, we can do a lot of things. Uh, we've done a lot in the last only nine months, really. Um, and it's just like, what what do we do with the plat? What do I and then the team uh, do with the platform and where do we direct our energy? Um, so I definitely feel you on, on that. Like no, I'm nowhere close to retirement, but um, in in that like what to do, I, I definitely I definitely feel you there. Um, you know, you said that like you came into this work by accident. You have no formal training, but you've been doing this work for over thirty years, um, and you know probably before you knew the word restorative justice, um, in your own words, how did you get into this? Um, I stayed home to raise um, my children, stayed home for about 16 years. Uh, that was a control issue. I couldn't allow anyone else to be the one who would have so much influence on their lives. Uh, and then I have a formal education, but uh, I was no longer particularly interested in that. And, and I had done a lot of community work. Uh, especially in my schools, started looking for work just so that I could uh, let go of my kids when it was time to, to let go. I, I thought of it as I needed to build another center in my life and started to look for work. Didn't have credentials for anything in particular, had no patience for going back to school to get a piece of paper, had learned so much as a parent and community activist that I didn't see formal education as particularly useful. Um, and so I had a very hard time getting a job, the only job that I eventually got after some time. Um, and that was through personal connection was with a little nonprofit that did criminal justice work. I had absolutely no interest in criminal justice and knew nothing about it, but he knew I understood policy and he trusted me to work with the board members of that organization. And so I took a policy position in a progressive agency in Minneapolis that worked on criminal justice issues. Um, so accidentally, because I had no other choice, yeah, I ended up working in, in criminal justice. And within the first year of taking that job uh, in a collaborative effort with the Joint Religious Legislative Commission, so those were, that was a lobbying group for faith communities, um, in a joint effort with them, there were some materials shared that included the earliest pamphlets published by Mennonite Central Committee about restorative justice. Mm -hmm. uh, spoke deeply to my own values and, and sense of the world. And so I then framed all of the policy work that I was doing around these concepts of restorative justice. And the agency already had a victim of mediation program and they did victim services and they hired people coming out of prison. The elements were all there, but they didn't have a philosophy that tied those elements together. Um, and restorative justice made sense out of all of these uh, things that, that they were, the programs that they were trying to do. They ran a, a parenting program for men in prison. They, there were all these wonderful things they were doing, but it didn't have a coherent philosophical framework. I ran into this writing on restorative justice it made sense out of all their programming. And so then all of my policy work for the agency was wrapped around the idea of restorative justice. Yeah. And from there, um, you, you talked about in like your, your Who Are You, the work that you do with Circle is a little bit beyond what restorative justice is. I'm curious how you define restorative justice and then how Circle transcends that and how you got... Um, into a circle practice? That's like a threefold question. <laughs> yeah, and the thing is, is that everything's connected. So of course, not a clear separation. Yeah. Um, but restorative justice for me uh, emerged in the context of some kind of harm. And so it was a framework for responding to harm that would focus on healing and would be shaped by the people most impacted by whatever the event of harm was, right? So it's focused on healing for everyone. <laughs> and, and it uh, can only, uh, at its best, is always going to engage those people most impacted by the event in deciding how best to heal. And that it, that was typically a dialogue process and collaborative. Uh, but within that, for me, there were, there were broader 
in a sense, you know, some sort of broader principles that would emerge that, you know, around voice in making decisions that impact your life. Now, that idea, of course, important in harm, but it's important in everything <laughs> that we do. So there's certain points that the framework emerged around responding specifically to harm of some kind. And this is the way in which I see the circle process is somewhat broader because um, with the restorative impulse is engaged after something has ha gone awry in human relationships. The, the circle, which I learned of in the context of restorative justice, uh, but so I need to back up and, and just remind <laughs> myself that so I came into this field as an outsider with no training. So I look at everything that I'm exposed to in the field through the lens of community rather than the lens of criminal justice as a field or as a profession. And so when I learned circle, I didn't just see it through the lens of, of harm and restorative justice. When I first, when I learned circle, I saw it as a fundamental human process for coming together, not just around harm, but for coming together to make our lives together. And so from the beginning for me, the, the circle was something that applied to every aspect of our lives. Whereas restorative justice was something that, that we engaged when something went wrong in human relationships. Uh, but those things are all mixed up and connected together because even, even when I, before I learned circle, when I was focused on the principles of restorative justice, for me, that would always wrap around that if the focus is healing, that it's also preventative, right? It's not just responding to the past, that if you create a healing response to harm, you've actually, you've also set the stage for the future. So that, that in that process, and I, one of the ways I would always talk about it is that um, the, any response to harm should leave the community stronger than it was before the harm happened. Right? So that's more than just responding about the past. That's about building a better future. So in that sense, restorative justice for me was always somewhat bigger than just the response to harm. It was that every response should leave the community stronger than it was before the harm happened. Yeah. Like, um, you, your introduction to restorative justice was through uh, this pamphlet from uh, the Mennonite uh, Central Committee, right? Um, what was your introduction to circle practice? Uh, I don't know where it came from, but I think that there was, there was an article that I somehow was exposed to, and this was before the internet, um, <laughs> where I read about uh, something happening in Canada and uh, so I can't, I'm trying to remember when I first learned about, uh, yeah, so I think, I think it was a, a conference in Minneapolis uh, and my, I worked for the Department of Corrections and they wouldn't pay for anything. So the only way I could get to that conference was to, to volunteer to work. So I volunteered to work. The conference was over Memorial Day weekend. It was the, uh, National Association of Conflict Resolution and Peacemaking, which I don't think it's, uh, or National Conference. And it just did a conference every two years. It was nothing more than that than sponsoring this conference every two years. So I submitted a proposal to do a, a workshop session on restorative justice as a peacemaking approach to, to criminal justice. It turned out two other people had already, had also submitted something similar. This was in that submission might have been in 94, the, the conference was in 95. So very few people had heard of restorative justice in 95, but two other people had submitted. And so they just put the three of us together and told us to do a, a workshop. And then they put us in a room where you had, it was at the Hilton in downtown Minneapolis, but somehow this room, you had to go down and underneath and it was way off in some corner where you had to be really determined to get to the workshop we were doing. So we're, we, we do our presenting, the three of us trying to put, like, we didn't know each other, you know, just trying to put this together. And then, uh, then there was the question and answer period and there was this really big guy who, who started talking about the work that he did in Yukon, Canada with circles and telling stories. And other people seemed to know who he was and I didn't know who he was. Um, and I was too embarrassed to ask who this person was. 
but I'm hearing, I'm hearing him talk about this process and I'm like, I know this, this, this is really something. And um, so at the end, I figure, oh, I know how to do this. <laughs> so I'll go up and ask him for a card. But it was more the weekend he was wearing shorts and he didn't have any cards. And I'm still too embarrassed to ask who this actually is. So I leave that, that conference feeling like I found, you know, the thing I've heard this, this is something really, really important. And I don't know who it was. And I don't even know how to ask because there was nobody else in the workshop that I knew well enough to, to ask about that. Um, so there it sits. <laughs> it's like, what am I going to do? How am I going to find this? That, that was in May. And that fall, I had been invited to speak, do a workshop at a conference in Winnipeg. And again, my, my department wouldn't pay for anything. And so to do that, I decided to drive, which is like a six or eight hour drive. <laughs> and they were willing, somebody in the, was willing to um, provide me with housing. But I had to pay my own registration for this conference. And at one point I thought, why am I doing this? Taking time away from my family and money out of my own pocket. Why am I doing this? And I almost didn't go, but I did go in the end. And there, the same guy, this big guy from the Yukon was there and I found out who he was and heard more stories about these circles. And I got his name and phone number so that I could pester him to send me his written material. And it was from that, that place, uh, that moment of reconnecting with him in Winnipeg that all of what happened around Circle in Minnesota, that was a critical link. Um, so it was through Barry Stewart and hearing his stories. He's a great storyteller and his stories were um, believable. They just, they touched my spirit in a way that I didn't, didn't know was possible. And I could see, I could see this as so fundamentally human that it was so much bigger than, than the criminal justice system or you know, any system, it was about who we are as human beings. Um, and that was, that was the, the, a critical, critical thread in the pathway to um, what eventually became my entire focus in the work. Uh, so you met Barry, you, you learned, you, you started to build a relationship, you read some of his things. Um, what came next? Because uh, for, for folks who don't know um you are one of the most published people in the field uh, around circles around restorative justice and this has come through a number of experiences but um you know i think it's really helpful for people to understand like this isn't something that Kay magically came up with <laughs> right um or Kay uh learned like uh how did you continue to learn so very inspired by the, the stories that I heard from Barry um, and his, you know, his description of how they were doing it. And I got him to send, he's a prolific writer, not published very much, but a prolific writer. And so he sent me the drafts of, of stuff that he'd been working on for some time. And uh, using the, that written material, I started exposing people in Minnesota to this idea. Okay, this, what about this? What about, this? read this, what do you think? Could we do this? Because uh, I had no authority at all. I had to engage people in being interested. And so I started sharing that information. That was right fall of 95. And by spring of um, 96, we had found a jurisdiction where there was a judge interested in this process. And uh, a local nonprofit um, that was able to submit a grant to bring when I, then I said to Barry, okay, so I'm staying in touch with Barry. And he said, okay, I've got a place for us to pilot this. We need you to come and train us. And he said, well, I, I can't train you by myself. I have to bring community members. And he brought with him a team of three First Nations people and himself then in August of, of 96. So less than a year after I connected with him in Winnipeg, we had our first training in Minnesota uh, for the first project to use sentencing circles here. Yeah, what was that experience? What was that training experience like for you and for other people who um, had no exposure to this to this way? So that first project was on the Malax Indian Reservation, and so many of the the members of the, the group that went through that training were from the, the reservation. And 
some of them had some familiarity with um, using a talking piece, with sitting in a circle, with sharing, not in the context of some kind of public process, right? but they might have had experience with healing circles, they might have had experience with ceremonial circles in a sweat lodge. Um, so there was a sort of basic uh, familiarity for many people who were in that group. But the, the, ex and the experience was just transformative for many of us who did not have that, that sort of foundation. It was magical. It, it, it had us feeling a connection that, and, and we started out as largely strangers in the space, um, that we could not have imagined before going through that experience together. Um, so it, it created an incredible uh, sort of energetic impulse to keep, keep trying to figure this out because we were trained, um, but there are lots of unanswered questions between you know, sitting in circle and figuring out how you apply these ideas in the institutions of the criminal justice system. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, my entrance into this work is similar to yours in that like first thinking about it within the context of like the criminal legal system and just being an alternative. Um, when I first learned the word restorative justice, uh, part of that uh, was in the age of the internet. Uh, and so Google search, YouTube searches, um, your name was one of them that came up. Um, one of the things that I really appreciated uh, was a clip of you talking about um, restorative justice and organizations not necessarily, or, or circle practice and organizations not necessarily being in alignment. And you used this uh, metaphor of, oh shoot, uh, th th this physics model. Um, I'm curious if you could uh, explain a little bit more about what that, about how those come into conflict. Yeah, um, I came to understand, and, and I didn't see this immediately. I think I felt it intuitively from the beginning, but I couldn't have uh, I, I don't think I could have framed the kind of under, the way I look at it now, which is that this way of being together in circle uh, represents a deep uh, cultural shift from the way I've been raised, from the way our culture in the modern Western world generally operates. And that uh, that one of the core ideas in this worldview that's in, that the circle sort of represents, one of the core ideas is the idea of profound interconnectedness, that it's not possible to disconnect, right? No matter what you do or how much distance you put between things, those two things still influence each other. It's actually not possible in this worldview to, to disconnect. I began to experience in circle this, and, and not just in the training from from the Yukoners, from the First Nations people from Yukon, and, and the, the key people there were Mark Wedge and Harold Gatsby and Phil Gatsby, along with Barry Stewart, who was not First Nations. But there was another teacher in my life who really helped me to begin to internalize this idea of interconnectedness, and that's a Native American woman by the name of Tanaka, who's here in the Twin Cities in Minnesota. And I began to, to, to feel this sense of interconnectedness. And, and recognize because uh, I was a math major in college. I had I took physics in college, and uh, that some of this sort of worldview that was a part of ancient indigenous communities, particularly this idea of interconnectedness, is also an understanding of, of quantum physics. Right, that one of the ideas in quantum physics is that you cannot disconnect everything that's connected. That, the, for instance, the measure always impacts whatever they're trying to measure, right? You cannot separate and stand back and try to measure something objectively. Not possible, okay? This is a, this is a teaching for, or learning from, from quantum physics. And the idea that, so another concept that comes from that work is that, that nothing is defined by its actual content. It's always defined by its relationship to other things. And so for instance, um, in physics, as I understand it, right, and it's been a long time since I did, did that, and so I may not even articulate this properly, but 
the, 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 when you're looking at very, very small particles, if you're looking for wave, you'll find wave characteristics. If you're looking for particle, you'll find particle characteristics in the same thing, whatever it is. <laughs> that that what, what you're looking for determines what you see in the characteristics of this thing that is neither absolutely wave nor absolutely particle was found the foundation so that that it we don't exist by our internal content alone we exist in this interplay between our internal content and whoever or whatever is observing or interfacing with our internal content um, and that also for me felt like part of the, the nature of circle is a we are each different, yes, and unique, and yet that that difference and uniqueness is only meaningful in its relationship to others, and that that relationship is the core, not something, not content. Relationship is is the core more than than content, although there there is content, right? It's not that that doesn't exist, and and so one of the ways that that this became clear for me was to understand the difference between a Newtonian understanding of the world in which you can in fact, so Newton's uh, articulation of physics that then shaped the, the way physics looked at the world until Einsteinian kinds of things, right? Not just these two people, but those are sort of major players in uh, thinking about how we understand the world. And the, the quantum physics world is this world that's quite different than the way Newton understood the world. Our social institutions are all still based on the understandings coming from Newtonian physics, right? The sciences have moved on, not just physics. In modern biology, some of the most interesting and exciting things are coming from people observing what happens in nature. And for instance, our concepts around hierarchy appear to be very misleading around the actual nature of life. And we looked at, at the way groups of animals or species moved or organized themselves and thought it was hierarchy because that's the way we organize. And they've come to understand that, no, it's not like that at all. It's not like there's a leader in a flock of birds. Something's happening in the group in the collective that is not dependent on singular leaders. So modern, uh, and again, it becomes more similar to some of the, the concepts of circle, which are also uh, concepts that, that were core in a lot of ancient and indigenous communities that, uh, that we are equal, right? We each have gifts, that one person is not more important than another person. This is built into the circle. And this is also reflected and what we're understanding out of modern biology and modern physics. Yeah, for sure. And I think like, it's interesting to see like the revival of all of these ancient ancestral indigenous uh, ways. You now um, you have, you, there's something that you also say often, something about like a teaching is a rekindling of a truth um, that like we hold deep inside us. Is that close to right? Yeah, that's close. Uh, that's a teaching from uh, an indigenous elder in Canada by the name of Tony Bob. And uh, what he shared with us was this teaching he'd learned from another elder um, that I, I think uh, I got it right because I wrote it down at the time. Um, a teaching is a rekindling of a truth we were born with. And that was, I loved it when I, I heard that from him because it resonated with the place I was in my own journey. I had come to believe that we all have this wisdom in us and that what we lack are spaces where we can be in touch with our own wisdom and the collective wisdom. And so it didn't depend on me knowing anything. I didn't have to know answers. I didn't have to lead the process. That that the wisdom was always in the group. Um, if you have a good process, right? Because <laughs> groups can do awful things too. But in a good process, the collective wisdom is always greater than any individual. And that circle was that kind of process when it was, was done well. And that uh, the gifts would come forward in the group. And that, that it's in us genetically in us genetically to live well together 
which is what you're trying to practice in circle, how to live well together. And that we're born with that wisdom, but we're also born with lots of other things and life experience layers on top of our natural wisdom. And so we're not always connected to our natural wisdom, but that the assumption for me uh, and, the, and the circles, the expression of this is that it's, it's always there. And then what we're trying to do in circles, create the conditions that nurture and bring out. But it's not about any leader. It's not about a teacher. Uh, I came to believe, actually not from circle. I didn't learn this lesson from circle. I learned it from doing um, presentations. I came to believe that I had nothing new to teach anyone. Mm. Everybody already knew. They just didn't know that they knew yet. <laughs> sure. uh, and that depends on their circumstances in life. Yeah. Uh, it, it's interesting. You said like all those layers that, you know, get added on. Um, one of the, it, when we do the trainings through Amplifier Day, one of the things that we, uh, root ourselves heavily in is like you know we're all most of us not all but most of us are born into uh, a society a culture um steeped in characteristics of white supremacy culture individualism power hoarding like one right way binary thinking those kinds of things um and the other one of the other things that we root our trainings in are like the seven core assumptions that uh you and carolyn uh aggregated from a lot of uh different um wisdom traditions and indigenous folks i'm curious how I hear them coming out um, as you're sharing with me right now, but like, how did you come to construct those seven core assumptions? That the seven core assumptions are a phenomenon in a sense that, in the sense that I never thought of them as laying out sort of the basis for others mm -hmm. at all. We had, we had created the book heart of hope. And a lot of people were using it, which was be created in a social services context. Um, but a lot of people were using it in schools and we knew that, that we needed something similar, but that was more targeted for schools. Mm -hmm. So that created the decision to write um, Circle Forward was that we had already seen that, that it was helpful to people to have these model circles to start with, to get them going, to give them some ideas, and then they could create their own, but that, that, that it really helped people to have that. Um, and that, that schools schools were trying to do circles and they didn't have much to work with in terms of like something concrete to shift from you know, what happens in the training to what you could actually do in a classroom. So, so we make this decision to, oh no, see, so the seven core assumptions are in Heart of Hope. So that's actually where it starts, I forgot. <laughs> Uh, and that was an accident. Oh my goodness, Heart of Hope was such an accident in terms of us taking that on. Too long a story to tell here, but um, we began to put this together and I was very conscious that there was, um, there's a lot of concern about trying to put this into writing, right? Because as soon, mm. as, soon as you create a formula, you create the best. <laughs> and, and so, and because for me, the work has always been about values, right? Much more than technique. It's about values more than technique. So we struggled with how do we try to convey, up to then we had just conveyed this process through direct training. Now we're gonna try to convey this process in writing. How do we do that? But also, uh, and, and it's a feminist perspective in terms of in research and writing, it's a feminist perspective that everybody has a stance right? there's no such thing as right sort of neutrality or everybody has a stance and that your obligation is not to pretend that you're neutral but to say what your stance is right to say to say okay and so for me that's what those seven core assumptions we were trying to do in the book is to say before you go further in reading this book it's important for you to know what we think is true that what what it is that we experience as truth that has shaped everything that we're going to offer as this book, book goes on. And so we were looking at ourselves and saying, what is it we think is so fundamental that if you don't agree with this, then the rest of the book may not make any sense to you. Uh, and, and not assuming that everybody would agree and not telling people what they should believe, but the idea was just to be clear about the assumptions we make 
about the nature of life that shape what we're offering. And, and that was, uh, I don't know what year that was, but by then I had been working with Circle probably at least for a decade and, um, and had had a lot of time with the Native American woman here who's been such a big teacher for me, Tanaga. Um, and so, yeah, we, <laughs> so we're sitting there together. Our writing was a back and forth process of talk, write, talk and write. And, um, and we come up with about six and, um, and Carolyn says seven, I like the number seven. And, and so we think some more and we came up with that last one. <laughs> um, but it, it, it was, you know, mostly for me, it was an exercise partly in, you know, getting clear for myself about what are the assumptions I make about the nature of life in the world? What, what is my worldview that, that then says circles a way to achieve it? Uh, and, and, and the other part is to let the audience know this is where we're coming from and what we put together here. I was very surprised when it turned out that, that people used those. I, I hadn't thought of them as part of the technique <laughs> that you would use. But then I would hear about people copying them and having them in the center of the circle and using them for exercises and training. Um, there were other people doing that before I figured out that that was useful. Uh, and, and so they have a life of their own and, and they're not ours. They're not ours. They were, they were based on things we've learned and the things that surfaced as most critical in our own that we've learned from, from other traditions sometimes, sometimes from the experience of being with people. Yeah, what were some of those uh, inspirations? I see a number of those ideas reflected in some Buddhist writers' teachings. Uh, I see the, many of those ideas in um, some Christian writing. I see those ideas in a lot of the, uh, so like the Anishinaabe people who are um, indigenous people here in, in Minnesota, they talk about the, the the seven core values that they have. And I can't, you know, name the seven off the top, but I look at those and say, oh, those, those are similar to these seven core assumptions uh, in some ways. And so um, they're, they're just, I mean, a, a lot of it for me came from teachings from indigenous people, but, but other sources as well, like as I say, the, the Buddhist teachings, um, if you go to uh, the teachings of Christ separate from organized religion, <laughs> then I think you can also find a lot of similar ones. I'm not that familiar with um, other sort of, you know, faith traditions, core teachings, but I have read from, um, well, some of the right, uh, so I'm thinking now about where I've seen this specifically. So I've read a little bit of the Dalai Lama's work, like uh, Ethics for a New Millennium. I find those core things right there you know, in his writing. Yeah, it's, so it's not that like these belong to any one group of people. It's just like when we're coming to do this work, I, I think what you're saying, what you said a little bit earlier, like interconnection is at the core, right? And you know, th these assumptions that like people are good, wise and powerful. Um, we have this need to be in relationship. Um, we're all uniquely gifted and everyone's needed for what they bring. We're spiritual, uh, mental, physical, emotional beings. And like we are what we practice in. Like there are like two that like I kind of smashed into one and I think I'm still missing one. But like these ideas are central to doing work that is restorative. And can you ask um, restorative questions without making those assumptions? Absolutely. You can say like, yeah, what happened? Who was impacted and how? What were you thinking or feeling at the time, right? Um, but if the root of where you're coming from is not in um, those values, um, you're not necessarily going to get the same results. Yes, I, I believe that the technique is helpful, but you can exercise the technique from a different internal place and you'll get a very different outcome, right? The, the technique does not make an outcome restorative. It is the combination of the technique 
and the way you hold yourself. I think of those, those assumptions. The people you're working with don't have to agree with those assumptions at all. <laughs> but for me, those are for me as a facilitator. If I'm facilitating a process for others, then, then I want those assumptions to guide how I show up in the space. They also, for me, explain why the space works so well. But that that you can you can do any of these techniques, whether you're talking about circle or whether you're talking about conferencing or victim offender dialogue with just two people, you can do any of those techniques and cause harm. If, for me, if you're not rooted, and they wouldn't always cause harm because sometimes things go fine. Um, but it's the the the, the uh, metaphor for me around this is this tree that, that I talk about where mm -hmm. the technique is the trunk of the tree. The root system are like these seven core assumptions that you need to be rooted in those core assumptions and in this belief that we have shared values that uh, about who we want to be in our best self across humanity, that that's in our genes. And those, those beliefs are the root system. The trunk of the tree is the technique that if the, the trunk of the tree could be fine without being rooted for quite some time until there's a wind. And if you are not rooted in mm -hmm. this place, the least little wind can take the thing over. So technique alone is not enough. That, that's also, so for me, it's the work I need to do on myself to keep trying to stay connected. And, and none of us can do that all the time. I don't live those assumptions all the time. I really struggle, especially with my family. <laughs> with those assumptions. I'm pretty good in circle, but not so much outside. Um, and so, so for me, the, the work uh, is to continually try to develop my own capacity to, to live what those assumptions suggest is possible uh, in human relationships. And, uh, and that'll never be done. <laughs> That's the hard news. Okay. This is when we're done. Good news is that actually sitting in circle helps me to live them more. Mm -hmm. I, th I think of circle as a practice space. It is not an end in itself. It is a practice space to strengthen our muscles for living in that way outside of circle. And my friend Gwen used to always say that the hardest thing about circle is to be in circle when you're not in circle. <laughs> yeah. I'm just digesting that, that piece. Um, I think about how, you know, circle work um, and restorative justice work has proliferated a lot since um, the early 90s. Oh, well, I mean, definitely since like um, Howard Zur in the 70s, 80s, 90s with circle becoming a thing. Um, and like that's done like a lot of a lot of positive things and I think like maybe like net positive but I think a lot of the times people are just going after the techniques to solve specific problems like we have issues with like the school to prison pipeline or over um of black and brown children in, in schools and so we're going to bring in restorative practices restorative justice um, or circle to fix that without necessarily um, bringing those assumptions to the table um, how yeah how does that sit with you? Uh, the, to me, that's a natural part of the process, right? We are a product of our entire social training up to the mo this moment in our lives. And we live in a culture that has trained us not to talk about values, not to pay attention, not to take the time to reflect on core purpose. And whether or not we're living our core purpose and whether or not we are consistent with the, the values that with our behaviors consistent with the values that we hold dear. And we we are we are acculturated to focusing on the problem as opposed to and so we're talking about a paradigm shift that is so much bigger than I understand. And I think that. That is, so I've been in this for 30 years. 2019 was 30 years since I read that pamphlet. <laughs> um, I didn't understand at the beginning how deep the shift is that 
that this is calling us to, that's just grown over 30 years. And my ability to articulate that has grown over all that time. And I've had the privilege of spending so much time in circles, so much reflective time that it, and no one else had the opportunity to, to spend that much time in, in, in that reflective space through the people do more now, but if you take the first 10 years of this century, <laughs> Uh, there's probably no one else who, who spent as much time in that, that reflective space. So, and in a teaching role where I had to be constantly explaining, right? I had to constantly think about how do you articulate this? How do I talk about, how do I describe what's happening in this space? And I had the gift of, of going to Brazil, right? <laughs> which, which crystal, yeah. going to Brazil crystallized this for me. This shift is so big. We can't ask people to go from two to 10, right? Just because you did a training with them, right? When their entire socialization, their sense of self, their sense of competency, their ability to make a living and get paid for what they do uh, depends upon them using this framework that we were all raised with. <laughs> uh, and so for me, it's a natural part of the process. What's critical is that we understand we're not there yet, right? Using the technique is a step in the right direction, but that we have to keep growing, we have to keep learning, we have to keep asking, what else does this tell us? What else can we learn about living together well from what we're doing? And where, where are we not living together well, even in our practice of restorative justice? <laughs> um, and so it's, for me, that's normal. You just have to make sure we don't think that's the end. Right? That's not the, the end goal in this journey. It's just a step uh, along the way. What is the end? I don't know. I, and I don't think there is one, right? right? That, that's a part of the teachings from exactly. that, that there is not an end, right? And we live in a culture that thinks, oh, I'm going to get to a certain place and then everything will be static, right? Right. This is the idea of impermanence from Buddhism is one of the one of the teachings that I that I really connect to, to this work is that there is no static state that we're going to get to and then everything stays the same that there's constant change constant learning and I don't know <laughs> uh, I don't have any vision for, for what that would like but I'm absolutely certain we can live together better than we are now <laughs> absolutely we have that ability. Um so we talked about like the start of like your circle work in the 90s and learning from indigenous folks and you continue to learn continue to start teaching people continue, that's when you like really started writing um and then you just mentioned that you had uh in this is mid 2000s right that you had the opportunity to start um taking this work uh outside of the states uh outside of canada to brazil and we talked about how like it's a paradigm shift uh that is not just necessary here um we've seen that um uh, the last time you and i spoke a couple weeks ago we talked about how um this work is needed especially with like the rise of like fascism fascism um and nationalism and like looking for just answers from one person and like blaming another group of people what application does this work have for the time that we're in, even with like, you know, a new Biden administration <laughs> uh, eminent? Oh, yes. Um, okay. So within that, we, ha we have this, this choice to make as human beings, right? I believe we are genetically coded for community. Right? Humans survived in community we are genetically coded to be in community, to be in good relationship with others. But we're also coded to, within our bonding, then to be suspicious of new or strange. And so we don't necessarily see all other humans as us. But we have the capacity to connect with them, every other human being, as us, right? Because we are deeply genetically coded to be in community, and we have the potential to identify other, uh, every other human being as a part of our 
community. And once we identify them as part of our community, then we understand our own well being as connected to their well being. And we understand that, that we can never benefit at the expense of someone else. It's one of the lessons of interconnectedness is that ultimately you can never benefit at the expense of someone else. Mm -hmm. That so violates the code of our culture because we have built a culture where people benefit at the expense of others on a regular basis. So, so we have that potential within us, right? And that's what Circle's trying to nurture. We also have the potential to do great harm once we can identify someone as other, right? If we can categorize someone as other, we, can, we are capable of great harm. Um, so what Circle is trying to do is to grow our awareness of our capacity to connect with anyone. I've sat in circle with people that I normally would not ever get into a conversation with. And in the experience of circle, I care about them. I love them as human beings. So circle can give us that experience of connecting across what we think are unbridgeable divides. And as a species, we have the capacity now to make the choice that that's where we want to go as a species is to transcend the sense of my group and your group to see everyone as a part of a human group together. And we haven't been trained for that. We've been completely socialized. And this is pretty much across the board because indigenous people also tended to identify with a particular group. It's just within their group, they were clearer about this connection and relationship to the earth. Um, so we have the ability to live well together across all kinds of differences. Mm -hmm. But we're going to have to change the way we think about each other, that we think about human nature. I mean, in the United States, the culture that got created here I believe was heavily influenced by the sort of Puritan ideals that came across some of the early episodes, which look at human beings as fundamentally base, requiring very rigid structures to keep them from just running amok. Right? I think that the reason we rely so heavily on punishment is that we believe human nature is fundamentally evil and we have to have these structures in place to keep it from doing just unspeakable harm. And the circle approach says that the humans are, the humans are fundamentally good, are capable of evil under certain kinds of circumstances, but they're fundamentally good. And uh, that if we rely on that goodness and we rely on nurturing our shared vision of being together in a good way, that we don't have to have all of these uh, structures to control others. We don't have to be so much energy in our culture is put into structures to control others. When if we relied on the goodness in human nature, we don't need to put all that energy into controlling structures. We need to put a lot of energy into clarifying our shared vision, renewing our shared vision, connecting with one another. Uh, around that that shared vision. And this is one of the things that I think is so interesting about modern biology is that they're looking at how other species organize and they're, uh, and they're discovering this, what they call self-organizing systems, right? That are not hierarchies, that are not based on control, but in fact are coming out of the impulse to work collectively in a, in a good way. That exists in humans, but we have to, we have to nurture it uh, and, and our culture doesn't. Our culture, in fact, uh, pushes us in the opposite direction in many of our habits. And so that's why this, to me, this thing is, is so big and that, that it's ultimately not about these techniques at all. It's about this, this cultural transformation. Can we, mm. can we shift to living together in a way that really internalizes the idea that I can never benefit at the expense of you. Yeah, and like, 
I think one of the things that you brought out, like, I've always tied this back to colonization, but you got, like, hyper-specific with it, with, like, Puritan ideals of, um, you know, humans being uh, fundamentally evil or, like, beasts, right? And how much easier it is to think about people who look different than you as lower, as, like, a lower level of human or subhuman, right? Um, and that's had so many harmful effects um, on indigenous people, black people, uh, people who are not white, right? Um, Earth itself. Well, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Right. Like in what way? In the sense of interconnectedness, right? Understanding mm -hmm. that I'm not superior to the ants. We're just different. Mm -hmm. Right. That, that that the trees are just as important as I am. Right. But but our culture is built on the idea that humans are the epitome of evolution, as opposed to, and this is one of the teachings that I have from Tanaga. Uh, in in their cosmology, it's flipped, right? Humans are the most dependent, dependent on all the other parts of, of creation. And so that makes them not superior at all. It's just the other way around. Um, so I, I think that that for me, all of these, this, this idea of interconnectedness is not just about human interconnectedness. It's about interconnectedness with the rocks and with the waters and with, with, understand the beingness of plants and animals and the rocks and the waters um, that and the, there's no hierarchy around more valuable and more important um, that and, and yet our our lives are completely structured around this idea of humans as more important more valuable right it's not that we're, um, like the idea of dominance um, and power over yes um, instead of um, yes. you know, everybody getting what they need, um, and sharing, sharing that power is, is so important. I think, uh, when you, when you bring it to like, um, different species or different, um, th pieces of the environment in the world that we don't think of as like beings necessarily, um, you know, in a lot of cases, they've been here longer than us and will be here, uh, long after, uh, our consciousness in this, uh, meat sack um continues to exist um, and so how do we continue to um, make a world that will uh, or how do we continue to create a world that will uh benefit all of us not just like in our lifetimes um or for like our immediate benefit but for generations to come yeah and i, I believe that our survival depends upon it that as a species the earth is going to survive no matter what we do right mm -hmm. we're going to be here in some other I expect some some form of life as as we think about that will will exist. Um, uh, it's our species that we need to to think about in terms of making this kind of change because I think we will destroy our own species uh, through climate change or through direct violence um, or a combination of of those things if we don't pay attention to the the interconnectedness and the idea that. Yeah, it just keeps going back to this idea that I cannot, I cannot thrive at the expense of someone else. Yeah, it doesn't mean that we don't. So from the native, and then you run into the problem of okay, we're taking life in order to live. That is a part of the nature of life, right? We eat food, and we either kill a plant or we kill an animal to eat food. That's a part of the exchange, and uh, from native people I learned the idea and then then you so how do you reconcile that with the idea that we're not we're not superior we're all equal um and that for me then was really helped by native philosophy where you you recognize your dependence and you thank the plant and you thank the animal for supporting your life and I developed a practice sometimes and I, I go through phases where I'm more aware of this and other times I sort of forget it for a while. But a practice sometimes of stopping to, to say to myself that uh, thanking like the, the food that I have and offering myself in service to that plant's purpose at the same time that it's offering, it, it has come to me in service to whatever my purpose is. That That perhaps there's a purpose for the plant and the animal that comes through you in that process of taking but but it's a it's a stance of humility and it's a stance of um 
of gratitude, right? When when you recognize that for me to live, I'm gonna, like, we just came back from the cabin and we burn wood, although, yeah, we burn wood there. And so we're taking these trees and, and burning them up in order to stay alive <laughs> because it's pretty cold. Uh, and so that that requires me to recognize the that life and to to have gratitude for that life that is now being used to support my life with all that is going on in the world as it is um one of the things that you have done over the last year um is um collaborated with uh, i don't know exactly who you collaborated i don't know if it was just you and carolyn or you and carolyn and some other folks to release an update of um this book circle forward that um you that, that has been used a lot in schools um can you tell me about uh, why that update came to pass and uh, what went into that yeah uh, so in the fall of 2019 i think uh mm -hmm. Carolyn Boyce Watson, who is the co-author with me on uh, Circle Forward, um, she'd been doing a lot of work in schools, particularly in Boston schools. She's uh, in Boston. And she had identified, she talked about the need for circle plans for adults in schools to have conversation about race because she was experiencing in her work um, in schools that, that the adults need to have conversations about race before you try, they try to have conversations with the young people. Mm -hmm. um, and so she indicated that she wanted us to do a revision of Circle Forward that would include a series of circles for the adults in schools to have uh, deep conversations about race. So this was before, you know, George Floyd and the kind of shift that that, that uh, created. And she started working on it. Carolyn did the bulk of the work on this. She did some writing that would be the introduction. And then I worked with her, um, did a little bit of contribution there, but Carolyn did most of it. And then, and then I worked with her on developing the circles. I love creating circle plans. Uh, and then, you know, <laughs> we recognize that we are two white women who wrote this thing in the first place um, and that this was not a good idea to just do this as two white women. Um, and so we turn, she, she actually has a team of people working in her center for story of justice at Suffolk University and they're mostly people of color. And so she then um, turned to them to, to help us look at what was already written, think about it, and to look at the, the circles to see are there problems with them, what else, what's missing. And I turned to a group of people that I know in Seattle, uh, Hui Ruru, um, and, and they're a, a very um, multiracial, multicultural group of people, and asked them to help us with what we've done. So, so we took what was we had created and then um, and we thought about it as like being in circle and we added the to reflect on the themes that that Carolyn had identified um, in particularly in the text part and they added some actual circles that went in so so it ended up being a collaborative effort um, of about let's see the, the two of us three five eight nine people maybe that uh created this so there's a a text it's a new module module 14 in circle four where the rest of the book is essentially the same and the entire module is focused on uh, having conversations about race and uh it attempts to to build starting with what we think is kind of the starting point and then getting more and more complex um, as it goes along. We're also publishing um, a short version of the Just Module 14 so the people who already have Circle Forward don't have to buy the new book. They'll be able to buy sort of addendum. <laughs> um, gotcha. 
circles in it. And so when COVID hit, it actually created space for Carolyn to do, she'd been uh, working on it in late 2019, but it was the space of COVID that actually gave her some time to focus on it. And so by the time the race conversation surfaced in the midst of COVID with such intensity in, um, in the summer, then we were already pretty well along and just so grateful that, that we would be able to put this out because if we had started then, you know, it would be another year um, probably before we could get it out. So it is another one of those moments of just sort of wonder about timing that has happened in my life um, in this work. And I realized that I, I'm, I forgot part of your previous question, <laughs> is that why this is so important in this time, um, why the circle is so important in this time and what the implications are for our work in, with Biden now uh, as president, is that the polarization that has happened in this country is not going away because Biden has been elected president. Right? There may not be quite so much fuel being poured on the fire, but that polarization is deep. And, and I have watched with some distress um, the ways in which people that I don't agree with have been demonized and characterized in very harsh, non-human ways. And I think that we absolutely have to turn to our own principles to be in respectful conversation with the people that we deeply, deeply disagree with. That's what we say our work is about. And that we have to go to that first core assumption, the good self and everyone, the core self and everyone is good, wise and powerful. Do we believe that or not? Now I can't, I'm not good enough to be able to apply that with every single human being, <laughs> to live it with every single human being. But I believe it's true. It's just that I'm not, it's my limitation, not their limitation. <laughs> that that is stopping me and and i need to stretch as far as i can stretch to listen listen i think we are at this place because a lot of progressive change was made that that i celebrated but i look back and say but i didn't listen to the grief of people for whom that didn't feel like progress whatever the reasons that didn't feel like progress. That didn't feel better. It violated something that they had grown up believing was true. And, and when you violate something that 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 felt like a part of, of someone's identity, then you create this demonization happening between people. Circle is the space to transcend that sort of demonization. And if we don't do that, and we're the one, those of us in this work are the ones who know how to do it. So we ought to begin with I'm, I'm going to be honest. So my, my brother uh, lives in D.C. right now. Um, and this week being what this week is in D.C., um, there are people out in the streets uh, saying, join me in binding the spirit of Jezebel from this nation. <laughs> um, like people on like far Christian right, right? Um, I don't have the capacity within myself to get into a circle space with the person saying that, right? Mm -hmm. What do we do? <laughs> so you don't, it's not your job. It's my job because I do have the capacity to sit in circle space. I believe, um, I believe I have the capacity to sit in circle space with anyone as long as they will follow the process. Right? <laughs> they have to listen to me as well as I listen to them. And they, and they have to, I mean, there has to be some kind of core values that we agree on about how we're going to talk to each other in that space. If they will agree to that, I will listen. I had the experience many years ago, many years ago, training in Alabama. And um, my friend Don Johnson did this training with me. He was a prosecutor in Hennepin County. And um, he's African-American. So most of the groups that we're training is white because it, it, it's people, a judge and the people she knows who are lawyers that she can persuade to come to this training, right? Because early 2000s, this wasn't very common. 
it was a, a judge who who really kind of put her reputation on the line to even bring us in to do this training. And she had recruited these volunteers who were mostly lawyers. And we got into, so do we have time for this whole story? Let's see, this we is do. a very interesting story. All right. <laughs> Uh, we did a values exercise that my friend Don led. And it, so we were in small groups and each small group came up with like four or five sort of core values. Came back to the, the full circle and then each group presented their core values. And then we passed a talking piece to see if everybody agreed with all of the ones that were offered. One of the groups had come back with God on their list. Don and I are sitting next to each other he goes left, unfortunately I'm on his right, and he goes left with a talking piece. And I'm faced with this dilemma that God is not on my list. I, I don't, a concept of God doesn't work for me as a way of understanding the universe. I am in the deep south. <laughs> I know that's not gonna go over well. And I'm all, so the talking piece is going around, everybody's saying whether or not they agree with all of the values, or are there any of them that, you know, don't quite work for them? And I'm trying to figure out, what am I going to say? Right? If I say that doesn't work for me, or that wouldn't be on my list, I've now lost credibility with the entire group. And I'm not so worried about my credibility, because I can go home and no problem. Um, but I'm worried about the judge. Hey, the judge has put her reputation on the line to bring me there. Am I now going to completely undermine her credibility in the community? And on the other hand, if I don't say that, I'm not being true to the process. And so I'm just struggling <laughs> with it. what to do. Because we're looking, do we have, what are the values we have consensus on? Comes back, but by the time it comes back to me, I feel, oh, okay, I have the solution here. I will say that that wouldn't have been on my list, but I'm okay with it being in our center. That, that, that that's, that's okay with me. It will mean that it would not have been on my list. And I figure I've given my friend Don an out. I'm, I'm, I'm saying I'm in consensus and noting that that wouldn't be my first choice. <laughs> Don does not take the out. Don decides, let's see if we can find consensus maybe a term like spirituality. So he introduces the idea people, maybe we can replace God with spirituality and we can have consensus on that. <laughs> a whole lot of people who did not have God on their own list are now completely attached to God has to be there. <laughs> people mm -hmm. harden up in their positions. I don't remember how many rounds we did. Don doesn't give up easily, but maybe two, maybe three rounds to <laughs> Don trying to find consensus on what we could say here. It's interesting because there are a couple of people in the group who like the freedom I just gave at the beginning of this to say that, that, that the way that's often framed doesn't particularly work for them. There, there clearly are still um, people who have a, a, a concept of God, but, but they um, but they like the, the sort of freedom that's been introduced in this tension. <laughs> and there are others who are just like, and one guy makes reference to that this happened shortly after the 10 commandments were forced to be taken down in a courtroom in Alabama. Mm -hmm. And one guy, big hulking guy over six foot, you know, strong, he's, he was in the military and, and he worked as an air traffic controller and like, a lot of power. Uh, he says, he talks about when you took my religion away from me, right? The Ten Commandments being taken down in the courtroom took his religion away from him. And I heard that differently than I had ever heard before. The understanding of people's Dis distress around taking down the Ten Commandments. <laughs> Next, that was day one. <laughs> day two, we always invite people to um, to bring an object, right, that represents some important aspect of their life. Mm -hmm. This guy, who had just been a few people away from me to my right, is now seated directly opposite me. When the check-in round comes to him, where you also share your object. He has a samurai sword. 
he speaks and he lays it down. <laughs> I'm thinking, it feels like that was for me, that there was some message for me in that. But I might, that might just be an ego thing that I think it's about me. I'm, I'll hold the possibility it's not, but I'm kind of thinking maybe that was for me. We go through the day of the training and, and um, when, in the closing round, he, he looks right at me and he talks about uh, America's military and the people who died for my freedoms. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh, <laughs> I didn't ask him, but he died for my freedoms. I don't think you died for, you know, those people died for my freedoms. That's what that's American military is about at all. <laughs> so I have this conversation about, and I'm thinking, if I don't say anything, if I don't respond to that at all, that was, and that was very clearly laid down to me. There was no question about that. If I don't respond to that at all, it's, it's kind of like silence is a scent, right? I, I don't feel good about just letting that pass as if I agree with that. On the other hand, I'm not at all interested. I'm not, I don't want to get into a back and forth about the American military. I have my opinions, but also that, that wouldn't go any place helpful. And I'm struggling while well, the rest of the checkout round is happening. Say, what do I say? What do I say? Just let it pass. I didn't feel okay. I want to get into a fight with him. We were doing the first two, two days of training one month, and then we would come back a month later because these people couldn't take four days in a row. So this is the end of this two-day session. And I had what is one of the finest inspirations at in circle is that by the time it got to me, I was able to look at him and say, I'm listening, not agreeing, I'm listening, right? I respect you as a human being. So the message for me is I respect you as a human being. I always know what you say, I don't, <laughs> I'm not agreeing. Um, and before we left that day, he came up to me and said, I hope you don't think I was being adversarial. <laughs> Um, the next, this guy was a gourmet cook. When we came back a month later, he invited Don and I to his house for a gourmet dinner on um, one of the evenings that we were there. It was a really deep lesson for me about just sitting still um, and not fighting back around things that, that I think I could disagree with deeply. Um, and, and understanding that he actually felt like we took his religion away. Now, that's not rational. He still really had his religion. He just didn't get to impose it on me. But what it felt like for him was like we actually took it away from him. So sitting in circle, I can come to a different understanding to how people get to the positions that they're in. I still don't agree with the position, but... I have a different understanding of what brings them to that. I don't think people of color should have to sit through these circles, as a for instance, <laughs> have to sit in these spaces. But I think white people should. I think white people, progressive white people, or whatever term you want to use, progressive or woke, whatever. <laughs> people who have the, white people who have the capacity, and who are not themselves another, you know, um, under some heavy oppression because of other characteristics that they have. Um, we are the ones who need to be able to sit in that space because until people are heard, they cannot hear anything you say. Until they are heard, and you don't have to agree. You, they can't hear anything that you are saying. Well, you gotta do a whole lot of listening, I think. To, to bridge this divide. And that's the skill we claim to have been building in this work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <I'm, laughs> because we're talking about like America and like thinking about that at scale, like I don't, I know what that looks like on an individual uh, interpersonal level. And to some extent, like I can deal with, I can sit in, in space. Well, like, 
all people of color have had to navigate <laughs> racism, racism and like, you know, sit and listen and like, you know, try to navigate that, right? Um, to some extent, I can do that. But when we're talking about this at scale, like, what do you imagine that looking like? I don't know, but I'm not, I don't have to. <laughs> I don't have to have the answer to what that looks like because I believe we will figure it out. We do have to practice in a micro scale, which is what we've been doing practicing in a micro scale, but starting to see that play out. So have you heard about the case here? Oh, did I send this to you? Did I think about it? I don't know. Where they took down the Columbus statue and they've just handled that case in a restorative process. Mm -hmm. How did okay. that go? Uh, I, I've only seen a little bit about it. I wasn't there, but the, the prosecutor's office put out a statement acknowledging the historical harms that led to this act and acknowledging that people tried in more peaceful ways to get that statue taken down. Mm -hmm. There was also accountability for the person who did it, right? Recognizing that for some people that that felt offensive or, or hurtful. But we have an example for the first time that I can clearly identify of collective accountability as well as individual accountability. That the prosecute, the government institution is saying, we have failed. First of all, we failed with all the harm that we caused and we have failed to create a way to address this that didn't require illegal action. Um, so those things are starting to move. So this is one city and one county. Sure, sure. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And, and a million small... but it's moving it's moving from just looking at individual accountability and individual sort of reconciliation or reconciliation of the individual with the community to starting to pay attention to the larger context the the other example that for me is very powerful is the that there there are about 28 or 29 uh, victims coalitions, sexual assault and domestic violence coalitions around the country who have signed a statement acknowledging that they caused harm to communities of color by contributing to mass incarceration. That is incredible. That is incredible. That's way beyond the micro. Now, it's way, way smaller than... <laughs> cultural transformation <laughs> mm -hmm. but it's but, but it's those things every day. model a model right it it shows us what oh because i've been talking about collective accountability for over a decade and and i couldn't point to any actual examples uh, at any at, at not at the policy level right um or i mean not at the the level of institutional accountability um, I have for where a community would, would take some responsibility for conditions that, that might have contributed to someone's behavior. But, uh, and now we have the story to fire our imaginations about what else is possible. And it's that problem we can't go from two to 10. I can't tell you what 10 looks like. I have no idea. But we can, we can picture two and we can picture from two to three and from three to four. And we can collectively figure out what would be the next step that's consistent with seven core functions <laughs> um you're the first person uh sorry you're the first white person that's been on this podcast semi-intentionally um and uh and, and that's for a number of reasons right uh, but you know you're someone who has learned this work that is not that you are not as closely um connected to within um your ancestry right how do you toe the line between adapting the practices to your context versus appropriation Um, so I, for me, that's primarily a question about, is this appropriating, right? Mm -hmm. Um, to be using this process. So I described that I experienced this as a fundamentally human process from the beginning. And I also knew from, from story, Barry is just full of stories, wonderful, wonderful stories. And one of his stories is about uh, as a Canadian, young Canadian lawyer being sent by his government to Papua New Guinea to help the Papua New Guineans 
create their new government because they'd gotten independence from Australia. <laughs> and the West, in its wisdom, is helping them. <laughs> um, but while there, he's a curious young man, right? and he spends time with communities there, and he learns how they do conflict resolution and, or how they work through difficulties that come up somebody gets harmed or murdered in the community what is it they do with, with that and uh, so he knew about a you know sort of form of something like circle and Papua New Guinea before he ever even went to the Yukon and became really connected to indigenous communities there and so mm -hmm. I got introduced to this as not just something done in you know those particular indigenous communities in North America, I got introduced to it as something that probably, and, and I knew about, I'd heard stories from people in Africa because I regularly got people from Africa in the trainings that I did at uh, Eastern Mennonite University. So I came to think of it as a universal human process. I actually believe probably all of our people at some point sat in something like a circle, because if you go way back in our roots, in very small communities, you would have to. You would have to come together when something goes wrong. You couldn't afford to throw people away. Uh, separation was a death sentence, always. Um, and so not taken lightly. And, and so you, you had to have a process like that. So I think of the, the circle process as a universal human process. My own people had long since lost track of that. I have a deep debt to indigenous people in North America who kept it alive so that people like me could connect to that potential that's in, in all of us. I also believe from the beginning of my work in Circle that if white people don't start using this process, we will lead us to human extinction. <laughs> that it's white people who need to learn the, this cultural transformation most of all. Um, that white culture is so the antithesis of circle culture, but that that circle culture could help us to see our own culture. I, you don't even see it when you're swimming in it. And that that so for me, there's a survival urgency around using this process anywhere you can get people to undertake it in a, in a way that has integrity. I think for human survival, it's really necessary. And I think, and I learned from, um, from Tanaga and, and from others that in uh, indigenous tradition in North America, it would be very common that you always name lineage, right? So that you don't just take something and, and use it and, and not recognize your teachers. And so recognizing teachers became a, an important part of um, what I try to do when I'm, um, particularly when I'm training, you know, this is, this, I name the people that I learned from. Um, and there, there's certain uh, key quotes I have and I name who they come from. And they're, they're from lots of different people's uh, things that I've learned over time. Um, and I think what I'm concerned about is that, that I'm, con I get worried that the conversation about appropriation bypasses the conversation about oppression. Right? What's really wrong here is the oppression. Cultures have always learned from each other. The problem is the oppression enacted by white, white culture on other cultures. And the, the that's that's the conversation that I hope we can have, and appropriation may be a way to the the conversation about appropriation <laughs> may be a way to to enter that conversation. And and I'll say that for, and from a very personal perspective, um, aside from in, any of the sort of logic that I've been sort of you know articulating. Here, in the early 2000s, when that question was raised, and when, when sometimes it might be suggested that people like me shouldn't, shouldn't be using this process and shouldn't be sharing it with others. And, and I would pay attention to my body when I, you know, what, what, what comes up for me around that question. 
what my body kept saying to me is that if I don't do this, I will get sick. I have been given this incredible gift. If, if I just keep that and don't share that with others, I will get sick. Uh, it felt so visceral to me that this was what I was supposed to do. Um, and I think that um, I do believe that good has come out of the time that I've spent sitting in circle. And, and it's always been important to me to listen deeply to the critique because the critique helped me to pay more attention to being mindful about always naming the lineage, uh, building that into my regular practice, to be, to pay attention to, are people raising something that I'm not paying enough attention to, that I'm unaware of, um, always, always, and, and I believe there was, um, I had the very early experience, way back, <laughs> late 90s probably, of a Native American man in a, a training saying, your people tried to kill all of our ceremony. What about the possibility that you are now showing interest in it, being positive about it, and the only way it survived was by hiding it. It survived because it went underground. Why should I believe that you're for real? Perhaps you're just, you know, doing this so you bring it back out and then you can really kill it. And I thought, that's perfectly logical. That is perfectly logical. So I need to acknowledge the reality that there are good reasons to question my involvement in circle very good reasons to question. And I need to be able to, to, to listen to those and to check, to check in. But my check-in place has, you know, especially in that, what they say, like the first decade of the 2000s, check-in place was, I'll get sick if I don't do this. I can't just keep this to myself. It's not okay. Yeah. I mean, I think like the important, uh, like an important piece in there for me is like making sure that like, um, the lineage of it is given, credit is given, the acknowledgement that, yeah, until 1970, right, <laughs> um, like, it was illegal to practice uh, ceremonies like this. Um, there, There's a way that people are taking the technique that they see without bringing in the values. And I know that's not something that you do, but, like, it's something that happens. Um, and when those values aren't brought in, then it's like, oh, you know, what are, what are you actually trying to do here? Yes, I think there are all kinds of risks. There are, there are all kinds of risks. Um, people are sometimes doing harm with what they call circle, right? That, that is um, using the, the structure. That's why I say structure is not enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, you can use the structure and shame people. You can use the structure and hurt people. Um, and... And we have an obligation, I, I have an obligation to do all that I can figure out to, to try to convey that deeper essence of the circles so that people don't just take it at a surface level. And, and I, I definitely um, have done some things that, that, that could be criticized for that reason because because it's some kind of a continuum and oh, what's the point at which you say, no, no, <laughs> that's too easily distorted. Um, or is it better? Because we, the other thing is that we need to be really careful about how we're measuring, right? Is it causing less harm than what would have been done otherwise? It might be, it might even be causing some harm, but sometimes it's less harm than what would have happened in the usual way of handling the situation. So the question, it's a very low bar. I mean, <laughs> yeah. it's a very low bar. When you talk about the child welfare system, the criminal justice system, the social services system, 
you can make a lot of mistakes in circle. You can be a really poor keeper and still do better than what would normally happen. So you have to measure against what would have happened otherwise, not against what would be perfect. And we have to stay in learning mode. We cannot get from two to 10. <laughs> we have to keep trying. We have to keep sitting with other people. We have to be honest about the things that, that are going wrong. We have to, so we have to create safe spaces where we can acknowledge the things that blew up in our faces because we will learn so much from those, um, but we can't. So I like to liken it to toddlers. Applying this process in the modern world is where it is just so new, right? The process is old, but applying it in a modern multicultural complex context, that's new. We're like toddlers. We've learned how to stand. We put one foot in front and we fall down and we're going to fall on our face again and again and again, but we gradually get better because we learn every, we can learn every time we fall. And that's how toddlers learn to walk. And so, and you don't give up. I mean, a toddler never questions whether or not they're going to learn to walk. You just believe, yes, we are capable of this. Uh, and we just have to try to get better and not bruising ourselves. Yeah. Um, we're transitioning into the questions I ask everyone. They're meant to be rapid fire. And um, I actually took this first question from you, and I know it can generate any number of lengthy stories. Try not try to make it one of the shorter ones. But um, what has been like an oh shit moment um, in doing this work? And how what, what did you learn? Or how did you fix it? Uh, I, I've had uh, a lot of those uh, over the years. And one of the biggest lessons in, in one of the strongest of those, uh, which is probably early 2000s, uh, the lesson was um, instead of wishing away what just happened, which was my first thought was, I, I was so upset at myself because I, I actually you know, I blame myself for creating the conditions where this happened. And I was just trying to wish it away. I wish I hadn't said that. I wish I hadn't done that. I wish I hadn't said that. I wish I hadn't done that. <laughs> And uh, what I learned out of uh, what happened in that moment was that <laughs> there's just no point in wishing anything away. What I learned was that instead of trying to figure out how to fix a negative thing or how to address a negative thing that happened, the best thing that I can, or push back in any way on a negative thing that happened, the best thing I can do is think about what do I bring in that's positive that rebalances the circle? What positive thing do I do to rebalance the circle uh, as opposed to what do I do to push back on something negative that happened in the circle? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it reminds me um, of a song from Frozen to do the next right thing. <laughs> so that's just what came to mind. Um, shout out Kristen Bell and Disney for your proliferation of your earworms. Um, what is one way that you've been restoring yourself? Uh, COVID, um, you know, kept me home. And so for the first time in many decades, probably, <laughs> I've been actually uh, getting physical exercise that I needed. Um, and, and that's been that's been really good and able to spend more time outside in nature. And that's always been important to me. So restoring myself through uh, taking better care of my body and, and getting outside. Yeah, for sure. Um, you had mentioned much earlier that like, it's easy to do this work in actual circle. Um, it's harder to do in your personal life um, or especially with your family um, to the extent that you're comfortable. How has this impacted? How has knowing this way of being impacted your personal life? There are times when it, it helps me to, um, to, to listen better, to, to wait till the person's finished speaking, um, just to be more accepting uh, of things that I wouldn't do the same way. <laughs> uh, but the, the other side of that is that uh, I'm also much more conscious of how much I messed up as a parent, you know, I would have been so aware if I hadn't been cultivating awareness um, and continue to, uh, am aware 
when I'm not being my best self, perhaps more than than I would have been otherwise. Uh, and and it's given it's also given me the the framework for for living um, living with mistakes. I, I have been. I haven't internalized this, right? <laughs> so I'm saying it gives me the framework. I've been able to fully take in that it's okay to mess up, that it's okay mm -hmm. to, to make mistakes. Uh, I somehow grew up learning the lesson that if I didn't do the, the right thing, if I didn't have the right answer, um, I wouldn't be loved. And so these things got really conjoined in my mind so that it, that I couldn't be loved unless I was always doing the right thing, which means that if, if I've done something that wasn't right, then I have risked not being loved. And, and so you can't, and so it's hard to acknowledge them because you don't even know <laughs> if you've done something that wasn't right. <laughs> um, so the framework is there for me, but it is really hard to undo the depth of that sort of um, way of understanding life that that was in me for so long and reinforced various ways. So, so I still struggle with that a lot, even though <laughs> I've been working on it for two decades. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's it's constant work. Thanks, thanks for sharing that. Um, you get to sit in circle with four people, living or dead. Who are they? What do you talk about? I just sit in circle with my dad. Um, Annie Sullivan. She was teaching me so much and I couldn't completely understand it at the time. <laughs> Want to know more? Um, maybe Ginny Mackey, another really important teacher in my life uh, and Cheryl Grace hey um, what do you all talk about what makes us cry Or not. Mm -hmm. I don't think I ever saw my father cry. Maybe where we wish we could have cried. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Who is one or a few people uh, I should have on this podcast? And before you answer, um, your answer, uh, now, uh, you have the responsibility to help me get that person on. <laughs> wow. Oh, uh, Jen, um, Jennifer Ball is a person I think would be really interesting to, to have on. And I can definitely connect you to her. I think Eric Assassin would be very interesting to have on. Thinking about the people that I have, Cheryl, of course, but that she I have. She was episode number one. That I have very interesting conversations with and, uh, and such life giving conversations. Um, and there are more, and well, not just all jumping to mind right now. But well, that's why I was saying in our conversation a couple of weeks ago, we need to get you your own podcast so you can be hosting these conversations, and facilitating and listening and learning. But that's a topic that we're going to talk about as soon as we get off uh, this call. Um, and finally, how can people support you and your work in the ways that you want to be supported? I have been so incredibly supported. I know people sometimes, you know, uh, think of me as having sacrificed in some way <laughs> because I've been in the trenches for so long. 
Um, but it doesn't seem like that for me at all. I've been incredibly supported. Um, and I don't, so I don't think of myself as, um, and I've been given so much love. I mean, that, that's the most important thing. I've been given so much love. Uh, and it seems to come just at the moments when I'm having doubts. <laughs> um, so people are already doing, I think, you know, what I need. Uh, I just, um, I want to know that, that people will stay in and not give up. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And also go buy the updated copy of Circle Forward on livingjusticepress.org. That'll be linked in, uh, the, trans, uh, in, the, in the show notes. Um, they, they can also reach out to you through there as well. That, and of course, do, do all the work. But that was also the place for you to plug all the things <laughs> that you have going on. Um, thank you so much for being with me this morning or oh, afternoon where you are now. Um, yeah, it was really good to get to connect. Um, this isn't the last time that we're going to talk um, and hopefully not the last time we're going to talk on, on these airwaves, but I just want to thank you for sharing your stories and your wisdom. That's been just uh, so energizing for me to, to be with you, just to have this conversation with you. It is my favorite topic. So. <laughs> <laughs> and, Absolutely. and it's so nice to, to reconnect with you. I'm just, I'm really thrilled. Thank you. Yeah same the same um thank you everybody so much for listening uh we'll be back with another episode uh next week until then take care um and we'll see you next week like what you heard please subscribe rate review and share this podcast on whatever platform you're using right now it really helps us further amplify this work you can also support us by following us on our social platforms signing up for our email list rocking our new merch joining our patreon or signing up for a workshop so many options links to everything in the show notes and on our website amplifyrj.com thanks so much for listening we'll talk to you next week